Good morning, everybody. This is Leland Judson here. I'm actually staying at the, the Riverside Inn at, in Kearns near the Stonehenge and the Mount Keminis site. And just to give you an idea some of the gear I'm bringing today to try to get the work done. So I got some equipment to measure the, the stones. Got my camera gear and drone. Gonna try to get some drone footage of above from the Stonehenge site. And my jacket because it's freaking freezing cold today. But hoping I can still pull it off. Do my best, I guess. See how it goes. Alright, here's Here's where I'm staying at the Riverside Inn. Get ready for my adventure. Heading out just a little bit before sunrise. And with a little bit of luck, the weather's going to hold up and I'll be able to get some footage down at the Stonehenge. It's looking really cloudy, but at least they're not calling for rain yet. No rain is actually probably the best weather I'm going to get on this trip, but wish me luck. All right. Basically walking down next to the gold mines And I'm on my way to the Stonehenge site You can see here that the the gold coin that has the thrace image is basically Just down the street from the gold mines I think that's where it is It's freezing cold out here and piles of animal crap everywhere. A little bit dangerous to be going alone, but I brought some protection. Now here we have one of my favorite clues to this mystery. It's here in the town of Virginia Town. Um, my friend uh, Maya came and helped me discover this clue. She actually came all the way from Bulgaria and happened to notice that uh, they have a giant coin next to the gold mines symbolizing uh, I guess the first gold coin ever minted at these mines and lo and behold uh, the image turns out to be not the Queen but one of uh, the Thrace horsemen The ancient uh, Thrace people are who used to live in Bulgaria, so this is a pretty wild clue and it was really awesome how Maya was here to, to help me decipher this and I guess I'll go over and take a closer look. Alright, I'm over here taking a closer look at the gold coin, or the, the monument to it. You can see that uh, the mine is actually right next to it. It's pretty, and I guess uh, the exact or the official reason they put this coin here is for a symbol of St. George. But when I looked up the history of St. George, it uh, turned out that uh, he took his image, or I guess the church took the image, of the ancient Thrace. And they had, uh, what is it, slaying dragons as one of their symbol on horseback. And it's pretty cool that this is what we got here. Yeah, so the main reason this coin is so important to my theory is because uh, what I'm trying to prove is that the ancient Thrace people were shipping gold from here back to the Holy Land down the, the massive river system that's just behind us going into the St. Lawrence and then into the ocean. So I think it's pretty uh, wild or a really cool clue that even here today in the town you find uh, the Thrace coin. So anyone who's wondering why I'm thinking the Thrace were here, it's like, I think there's a few people else that also agree with this theory, but I'm not the only one. All right, next I'm gonna take a look at some of the other monuments here for the mine.
Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, really old mining activity that was going on here. See what we got. Yeah, it's kind of a little neat memorial they put up. Any other clues here? Yeah, I think as far as gold mining in Canada goes, this might be some of the oldest. And they also have a, a heritage trail that you can hike on. So one of these days when I got more time, I'm going to have to check out that trail. See if I can find any more clues to solving this mystery. It's kind of neat. I was just checking out the other side of the coin, the gold coin here. And they have the image of a king on it. And it's neat. I don't know if it's another coincidence, but... Turns out the king in this coin, and he has the same haircut as me. Yeah, taking a look at the plaque here, it explains... This is a 1908 Canada's first gold coin, minted with the gold from Larder Lake Mines located at the site of this place which also happens to be the, the ancient offering table and the king uh, or the Stonehenge site. Pretty neat that they put a coin to commemorate the, the Thrace connection to the Stonehenge and the shipping of the gold. It's a pretty wild mystery here and here's probably one of the coolest clues to it. Dr. Reddick was one of the original members of Winchester Lodge AF and AM of the Masonic Order. Winchester Hiram Lodge 21, founded in 1768 west of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia, hence the name Virginia Town. Alright, as I continue down the, my journey to the Stonehenge site, checking out some of the other names of the places in the area for clues, and I found one of the lakes here is actually called Barber Lake. And for those of you who don't know, the the Barbers or Berber people are from North Africa. And they were involved with the, the interactions between the, the ancient uh, seafarers because they were going down the Mediterranean. And it's kind of neat. I was lucky in a way that I didn't get some rain today because it's cold enough that we got snow instead. Yeah, I was looking up the, the reason for that name and... Uh, Turns out that the, the people in northern Africa there were rejecting all types of technology that they wanted to live off the land rather than go with the civilized method, but to each their own. And when you think about the damage and the pollution and all, it's probably one of the better ways to do it. So that's actually where we get the term barbarian from, is uh, the Greeks called them the Berbers and then we call them, eventually came up with the word barbarian. So. There's a little bit of a history lesson for that sign, if anyone doesn't know. Yeah, I was just on my way to the Stonehenge, and I left early this morning. Yeah, there wasn't any stores open, I was all out of food, so... I'm starting to get a little hungry for breakfast. Uh, luckily, I, I'm a member of one of the foraging groups on Facebook, out of London. And learned a lot about the different plants that I could eat on the way that I find in the wild. Just recently tried some birch bark and it's high in fiber, but man, that tastes awful. So I decided to go with the tried, tested, and true with some dandelion leaves. It's like they sound kind of gross to eat, but you'd be surprised how many people eat them in salads and don't even know, because a lot of restaurants, I guess, these days are adding dandelion leaves. Just gotta make sure that they're clean. It was raining a lot, so pretty sure nature washed these for me. So here we go, eating some dandelions on the way. Hmm. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Dandelions actually taste great. Starting to give me a little boost of energy again. All right. Well, I'm almost at Bear Lake now. Cool thing about Bear Lake is, uh, I think it was one of the clues that helped me find the Stonehenge. My friend Maya, that came all the way from Bulgaria, is actually a really avid bear enthusiast and. It's kind of neat that the road that goes, it's like a, off the side, sort of like just a path like that one, that goes to the Stonehenge off the main road, is right next to the Bear Lake rest area, so 
could be just another coincidence, but I don't know, pretty neat. All right, I made it. After just a little over an hour of walking, I made it to the Bear Lake rest area. And it's kind of neat. As I was saying before, this Bear Lake rest area is the closest spot for parking if you're going to go check out the Stonehenge site. And there's a little unmarked trail off to the side of it that takes you there. Yeah, so here's a picture of what the Bear Lake rest area looks like. Yeah, it's kind of neat. I was out of food and I was foraging a bit and I managed to find some clovers. If anyone's ever hungry and wants to eat those, they're not only good for you, but they actually taste great too. If you eat the flower part of it, they've got some sugar in them. Mmm, great snack on the road if you're out of food. Now last night when I was dreaming before coming on this trip, I uh, seen a lot of bears in my dream. So I was wondering if maybe, well, sorry I shouldn't be talking with my mouth full, but yeah I was wondering if I'd see some bears here at Bear Lake, but so far no sign of them. Yeah maybe if I'm quiet I could run into a, a beaver. No sign of beavers yet either. Yeah, the nice thing about this Bear Lake rest area is that they got some decent washrooms. They're fully equipped with everything you'll need. And if they're good shelter if you're stuck out here in the rain and you need somewhere to get away from it, it's like, I guess it wouldn't be the greatest to hide in a washroom, but better than getting soaked, right? Yeah, the weather's starting to improve a little bit. Snow's letting up and the sun's coming out, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a rest here and then continue my journey down the, the unmarked road across the street. Here, I'll see if I can show you it. It's basically just down the road, like, I don't know, a two minute walk from the rest area. You hang a left. And that's how you can get to uh, the Stonehenge site. All right, just down the road from the Bear Lake rest area, you'll find this. What we have here is a, a natural spring. And I guess what the town did is they hooked up a tube and have it coming to the sink here so that uh, it can fill up your water. They do have a sign up here saying that the water isn't tested. But uh, my friend Chuck showed me this spot and he lives up here and I uh, He says a lot of people from town come here to this spot to fill up their water. So if everyone from town is drinking this and uh, it's been set up like this, I think it's a pretty safe bet to refill your water bottles here. If you're coming to see the Stonehenge site and you run out of water, or if you happen to be camping overnight at it and you need more water, this is a good spot. And it's neat too, cause it's like, here I'll try to show you. This water tap, is basically right across the street from the, the road that goes into the, the Stonehenge site. Well, I guess you can't really see it because you have to be on the other side, but... To me it almost seems like this is another clue. That the, the area that you're wanting to go to to find the Stonehenge has everything you need. Not only does it have dandelions to eat and clovers and a bare lake rest area, but it's got some drinking water. So really, if, if you're going to come out here and try to live off the land, you couldn't pick a better spot to do it. It'd be strange to have all these amenities so close to a spot that wasn't of any importance. So, yeah, there you have it. Another clue maybe to finding the Stonehenge in North America. Yeah, and just to prove it to you that I'm actually drinking this water, I bought a water bottle from in town. I'm going to refill it. And try a sip. Yeah, amazingly fresh. So you compare it to what you get out of water coolers and stuff, it tastes a lot better, a lot less plastic here. 
So yeah, I'm gonna refill my water bottle for the trip and uh, head off to the Stonehenge site next. Wish me luck. Okay, I walked across the street from the, the water area where you can refill from the spring. It's right over there. And here you have the trail that goes into the Stonehenge site. And then from that trail you can look over and you can see there's the Bear Lake rest area. Just around that bend if you're if you're not coming here in a pickup truck, I advise you to park at the Bear Lake rest area over there. And then you can just take the trail from here. But if you happen to be in a pickup truck, you can uh, navigate this road. And I know a few people I've seen drove all the way down it to the beach, so it is doable. But if you're coming in here in a car, I highly recommend uh, just parking over there because you don't want to get stuck in there. You're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. It's going to take forever for CAA or a tow truck to come and get you. Yeah, but here's a, just a perspective. Uh, there's the trail. There's the water tap. I'll zoom in. Yeah, there's the, the sink for the water tap. Alright, so I'm going to continue on down this trail and my next stop will be the Stonehenge site. Wish me luck. And I figured since now that I'm alone in the woods and we're getting pretty deep in here, I decided to make myself a, a walking stick. And it's basically... Just took a branch from the forest and... Made myself a bit of a walking stick, so this way not only does it help with the, the walking, but if you did happen to encounter a bear, it couldn't hurt to be armed. And for anyone who hasn't taken this trail before, you just come in off the main road on the path across from Bear Lake, and you just keep going down the main road right till the end to the lake. And it's actually the, the last left-hand turn you take goes to the Stonehenge site, so if you're seeing other trails that you can turn on like this one, don't take it yet. You're going to have to walk down the main road for quite a while. Unless you're in a truck and you're driving there, then, then you won't take long at all to get there. But I'd say it's roughly about a half hour walk or maybe 45 minutes from the Bear Lake rest area. I know I said it was 20 minutes before and the group that I was walking with complained that it was a lot further, so maybe it is closer to 45 minutes. We'll, we'll see when we get there. As I've been walking down the trail, I've been hearing gunshots going off quite a bit. I'm wondering if it's a hunting season now again, but just be careful when you're out on these trails, you make sure to wear bright clothes. I know I'm kind of contradicting that because I didn't wear bright clothes. There's also an ancient legend about how if you wear bright clothes in the forest, you can be abducted. So I think you're still better off though wearing the bright clothes because you never know. Like the odds of getting abducted by some spiritual creature and the odds of getting killed by a hunter. I think uh, the hunting one is a little bit more dangerous. And just to prove to you that I'm not making this stuff up. It's like I found here on the ground while I was walking some rifle shells or shells of some type. I don't really believe in guns and I've never shot one myself so I'm not sure exactly what type of shell that is but just be careful when you're out here. Alright, I got some good news. I managed to hike my way all the way down to the lake. Yeah, and this lake is uh, the spot me and my friends camped at last time. If you go get to the end of the road and you hang a right down this trail, there's some really super nice campsites, like some of the nicest campsites I've ever seen in my life. Get your own private beach and not a, a soul anywhere around here, especially if you come during the week. This is kind of a small town area and uh, it's really remote, so it's definitely worth checking out if, if you're ever gonna go visit the Stonehenge site and you want to camp here it's like I highly recommend it I hope it's not private property and I'm telling people to camp on it but uh, I've never seen any signs of private property down here so you should be fine to do so 
Yeah, and some of these campsites are so nice. They even had lawn chairs set up and like makeshift washrooms and clotheslines and it's really a beautiful spot. All right, so if you've came this far, that means that you've missed the road down to the Stonehenge. Basically, you have to go back up the road from the lake and then uh, take your first right. And then once you take that right, you're going to go down a sandy path and then from there you'll you'll be at the Stonehenge. So I guess that's where I'll meet you guys next. If I was going to be driving in here with a pickup truck or something, I'd probably park in this rest area at the fork in the road. It seems kind of disrespectful to, to drive a, a truck all over a sacred site. So if you're going to make it down here with the truck, park here and walk the rest of the way. That's what I recommend. Well, I finished hiking down the road and I just about came to the Stonehenge site. Sorry, I just get a little bit emotional every time I'm here for some reason. Maybe it's some missing my friends that were here the last time or it's just uh, the spot really hits me, I guess. <laughs> so I guess I'll leave the camera running and show what it looks like to walk into this place. Here on the ground you can see some of the, the lines that were scratched in from the, the, the glacier movement. And here's the wide open field. Some of the scientists that have been here to study this site commented how it's really strange because uh, the rest of this area is really dense woods and to have this wide open of a spot seems really unusual. But my uh, friend JJ, who's been sharing research on different stone circles from around the world, found one while well, she didn't find it, but she visited one in Europe. And I guess uh, what they did with their stone circle sites is they managed to make a clearing like this as a way of signifying the size of the ship that they used. And they call it a ship, so I don't know if that's really what this one is or it's just another coincidence. Now this uh, wide open field area is also uh, known by the First Nation traditions to be a spot to, to gather energy. Last time I was walking here I tried walking in bare feet for uh, different areas around here but this trip I'm not going to just because it's so freezing cold. I don't want to risk getting frostbite. And it's already snowing a bit and we're getting a little bit of a clearing in the weather with no snow so maybe I'm going to get the drone going and give you guys a, a view of what this place looks like from above soon. Yeah and just watch your step when you're walking on it. It's remarkable how slippery some of it is. Yeah, I don't know if it's just my cold hands, but it almost feels like you can feel an energy here. How I found out about this Stonehenge site, I was researching an offering table used by the Thrace on the top of a mountain that's near identical to the one on top of Mount Keminis. After learning they had a Stonehenge nearby, I decided to check if ours in Canada did as well. And lo and behold, Professor Bill Steer of Nipissing University had published a blog on just that. His blog titled Stonehenge Conundrum in Northeastern Ontario recapped the findings from Vernon Dufresne and it explains how the giant stones aligned with the summer and winter solstice, as well as the north-south direction in line with Polaris, the North Star. He believes the rocks were moved by indigenous people to achieve this effect. All other boulders were pushed away by the ice during the last ice age, making them really stand out. I dug deeper and found an article in the Timmins Times by Diane Armstrong on the site and discovered our government had been here to study it and the Ministry of Natural Resources had labeled it an important historical site. They removed the signs and planted trees next to the standing stones to hide it from vandals. Sadly, they make photography and studying it much more difficult.
All right, here we have one of my favorite stones from this uh, sacred stone circle, and it almost looks like a person's face. Next, I'll show you what some of the other stones look like. It's really neat how you can see these balancing stones that are set up underneath it. Almost like they wanted it propped up perfectly, whoever built this on a certain angle. Alright, so that's the perimeter of the first stone. The next stone is a really massive one. Maybe when I make this video I'll post a picture of what it looked like to stand next to it. Yeah, this boulder is massive. It's hard to even fit it all in one frame. I'll show you guys what it looks like around. Yeah, here's some more of the balancing stones, even under this one. It's hard to believe that they were able to balance the size of a rock. I know that I wouldn't be able to budge it or anyone really, unless you're a giant. Alright, next I'll show you the third stone. Boy, really quite the incredible sight to be here again. Yeah, even this stone. It's like so far all three of the stones I've checked have these balancing stones underneath. It's kind of a shame that uh, pine trees have grown in and blocked a lot of Whoa, yeah, I wasn't kidding, that's some slippery moss. All right, I guess it's not a shame that the pine trees grew. Sadly, we got some beer bottles laying next to this site. Maybe when I have more people here to help, I'll be able to clean up some of the garbage people left. Yeah, so if these pine trees hadn't grown between, whew, moss and rocks definitely don't make the greatest combination for foot. Footing. All right, so that's three of the largest stones. I actually thought there was only three stones that consisted of this circle, but my friend Mai was saying that there was a fourth one. So I'm going to look around and see if I can find the fourth. There's actually quite a few more stones over here. I'll check them and see what I think, if they're part of this stone circle or not. Oh yeah. Looks like uh, they've got balancing rocks under them. So I wouldn't be surprised if this really is more stones for the stone circle. Yeah, this large rock here also has rocks balancing it perfectly. Now let's see if I can get this all in one shot. Yeah, a lot of the branches and trees and stuff have grown in here, but it looks like this stone circle is a lot bigger than I originally thought. We got one stone here, then a second stone, then the massive third stone over there, then the other fourth stone there. So that's one, two, three, four, Oh, here's another one over here. Oh, a few more over here. Wow. 
Yeah, my is really gonna have to come and see this. I wish we would have explored more when we were here. We definitely got some other large rocks here. Okay, here's another one. I better be careful I'm walking on moss and slippery rocks again. Yeah, what do you know? Here's some more boulders. It's like I wonder how many there is in total now. I'm gonna have to count. Well, it continues on that way. All right, so that looks like the end of the boulders that I can see from that part. Here's another large boulder over here. Man, walking on this moss is like a carpet. Hope I don't get a soaker. Yeah, what do you know? These ones got balancing rocks underneath too. So it's definitely a lot more large boulders than I originally anticipated. My first trip here I only counted three. Maya counted four. And now it seems like we're almost up to, I don't know, seven. Yeah, it couldn't have been an easy task to move all these boulders and align them. Yeah, here we have another large boulder. All right, so there's the other one. Okay, now this is definitely looking a lot more like a circle to me. At first, at first when I heard people saying this was a stone circle, it seemed kind of odd with just three. But now that I found the other boulders nearby, it's just all these trees have grown everywhere and are blocking them. But I'll try to do a panorama and show them all. There's one boulder there. Another large boulder in behind those trees. The massive boulder there. Another boulder there. Yeah, sorry if the camera's shaking a little bit. I'm walking on unsteady ground and my hands are frozen solid. I guess I could have wore gloves, but I would have been risking dropping the camera wearing those. Okay. Yeah, there's that boulder. Ah, and this boulder over here. It's hard to tell because, oh yeah, trees are blocking it. Yeah, another boulder there too. All right, so I think I'll have to do a count of how many boulders we got, but there's definitely quite a few that make up this stone site. Yeah, it's got more balancing rocks underneath, so I definitely think it's part of it. All right, the next part of my plan is I'm gonna set up my drone try to get some footage of what this place looks like from above. Maybe it'll help make a, a map so I can show people the actual shape for what this site looks like. All right, the next thing I did is I brought some orange cones so that I could mark the rocks, hopefully making them more visible from the air. And I put some red markers on other ones too, because I didn't have enough for all these rocks. I thought there was only four, but now I think I've counted almost 10. And it's even hard to count them all because some of them are really buried deep in trees. So I'll just give you guys an idea. 
There's one in there. One, two. This is a measuring tool that I brought so I can measure the distance between the two rocks. So it's two. There's three in there. Four, that big one there. And then in behind that big one, there's two more. So that's five, six. And let's see if we can see it from here. But there's two other giant boulders, a part of this that are in behind those trees that grew in. Uh, yeah, there's another one over there. So this site is actually a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. I anticipated just four stones to mark, but definitely more than four have been put here. Yeah, see there's those two. Well, can't even see it. Let me get closer. Yep, there's those two boulders there. Those two. And then another two over there. That giant one and another giant one behind it. Now I've heard some different, or read some different theories on what the shape of this is. Some people think it's the First Nations medicine wheel, so... Yeah, there's the other boulder there. Boulder there, boulder there. So let me do a little count here. We got... Oh, I put another marker over there still. Alright, so there's another one there. Oh, two more. So, one, two... Oh man, there's another massive one there. Did you even see that? Holy cow. So... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven in this section of the stone circle. And, whoa, sorry, it's really slippery. Seven, eight, the giant one. Eight. Nine for that one behind it. Nine. Ten. There's that one. Eleven. And, oh yeah, I got another one there. Okay, so it appears that there's twelve sacred stones here. Could be a few more that I haven't counted yet. Just, it's difficult to navigate around here with all these trees blocking everything, but... 12 is kind of a significant number. 12 houses of the Zodiac, 12 tribes of Israel. I could have missed some, but it appears that we have 12 giant sacred stones that have been assigned here. Not the original three or four like I anticipated. All right, next what I'm gonna do is use the, the measuring tool I brought here and measure the distance between each of these stones. See if I can get uh, some of that recorded next. And next, before I try to get any more information about the stone circles, I brought with me some tobacco. I'm offering it just to give thanks to the, the Creator. Not only for the tobacco, but Give thanks for this amazing stone circle site and the energy that it collects here. It's truly remarkable. Alright, next what I did is I managed to measure the, the width of this large stone clearing next to the sacred stones. And it appears to be about 84 or 85 feet wide. And I'll try to get the measurement of how far it is across next.
gonna knock a king for gold. Ancient aliens for the gold. From that boo-boo for the gold. Our history books, they are mostly wrong. I had to write it all down in this song. Well, I'm taking my first break. I haven't really sat since I started this hike today. Just checking the time and how long it's been. I've been walking for almost four hours non-stop. So I guess I'm a little bit overdue for a break. It's kind of neat that the energy at this site... I don't know if it's helping me walk all the time without getting tired, but... Yeah, maybe just the adrenaline rush, but... Really, I don't feel that tired, so I'm only going to take a short break and then continue filming. I brought a little bit of a tobacco here with me to do an offering. Here's another shot to see what the, the large clearing next to the stone circle looks like. I'll zoom in and you can see that there's the one boulder there, but if these pine trees weren't here, the other stones would be clearly visible. They're in behind that section of trees, and the largest one's behind that middle tree there. You can sort of make it out in behind. I don't know if someone would ever want to speak to the First Nations people about re-clearing this spot so that you could see all the stones at once. I think it would make a really big difference for people realizing the importance of this location. Next I'm going to try taking the drone out. Looks like I might have a clearing enough in the weather to, to try filming without getting completely soaked. It's a really expensive drone so I don't want to risk damaging it and having no, no way to film. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is try to set up my DJI Mavic Pro to film the stones. Here's the drone here. This is one of the best drones you can get for portability and for high resolution video, so... I'm still new to flying it and I'm really nervous, but... Really, a lot of stuff's been going on at home that I'm way more nervous about. I've got an uncle that's been in out of the hospital with heart conditions and a lot of friends and family going through hard times, so... Really, I got nothing to lose here. This is only a drone after all. After returning home and watching the drone footage, I was very disappointed. The trees had blocked seeing the stone pattern, even from above. But the orange cones helped me to count the 12 to 14 stones, and they reminded me of Draco constellation. As above, so below. I learned these stars are circumpolar, that is, never setting, meaning they can always be seen from our location in the northern latitudes. Another explanation of why this site up north would have them. Legends have it, Draco was a dragon that guarded the golden apples and the garden of Herpesides. Reminds me of how Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, and their son Cain was sent to Nod in a faraway land, in a forbidding wilderness with gold. Just like here. Cain's argument was over what is the best sacrificial ritual and resulted in his brother's death, like the sacrifice spot on the nearby Mount Cabinus. Could this be another reason the first coin was minted to show a dragon like Draco? A symbol of many layers, not just showing the connection to the Thrace traders from today's Bulgaria navigating the seas, but maybe the mason Dr. Reddick had solved the meaning of the Stonehenge all along. I discovered the gold mines found all around this ancient standing stone site is ranked the second best gold in the world. Draco is also next to the Little and Big Dipper, known as the Little and Great Bear, possibly explaining the name of Bear Lake that marks the trail entrance to these sacred stones. Just so has it. These spinning stars around the North Star happen to make a controversial symbol. This symbol matches the name of the nearby town Swastika and the Swastika Gold Mine. Over the years, activists had asked the town to change its name, but 
they kept saying the history of the region should not be forgotten, and it long predates the tragedy of World War II. Earlier that week, our investigation team had visited the Rom Museum in Toronto, and we found this symbol was a very important thing to many cultures around the globe. Some may argue this means the First Nations people did not erect these standing stones, but I would say they have a rich history of the stars above as well. They came through space and time vortex. 
changed the human's DNA. Made them slaves in their gold mines every day. The Illuminati know who they are. If you run in those circles, you might see them too. Anunnaki came for the gold. Well, that was a heart racing experience. I just flew the drone over the stone circle and tried to get some of the surrounding video and sure hope it turned out well because I pretty much only get one chance at this and I'll go check to see how the drone's doing. So far so good. Looks like the drone landed in one piece. All right, I walked just down from the stone circle site, up that trail there, or down that trail. When you come to the beach, you can see that there's a lot of flat rock here going right to the water. You can see the scratch lines from the glacier movement. Yeah, down over there is where we camped the one night. It's a little bit gloomy conditions today, but I'm still going to try doing the drone video. You can see the, the fog or clouds moving in over the mountains. It's really quite an incredible sight. This massive lake connects to the Ottawa River and back down to the St. Lawrence and then on its way to the ocean. So I'm thinking, if there really were ancient pagan people that were moving gold from here to the Holy Land, this might have been the spot where they started loading up some of the ships. Hence the reason why we have this uh, stone circle site here up the road with the, the ship placement the wide open field or plateau of rock that has been cleared to mark the size of the ship. Here's a point of view of what it looks like to walk up from that stone ramp that goes down to the lake. Really would have, we would have camped here the first night, but I didn't know how close we were to that. Yeah, so then once you come up here, you have the large clearing or plateau of flat rock. It's on a slope down towards the lake. And then from there, we have the boulders. I wonder if one day there'll be a restoration done to this site to remove some of the trees so that you can really see the stone circle all at once again. All right, before I head out, I guess I'll show everyone the Anubis amulet. This is a little guy who's been in my family for decades and it's a pretty rare amulet. We think it could have gotten to Canada from the Phoenicians and maybe the, the ancient Thracians. So it's kind of neat that here I am with the Anubis amulet standing next to the site. Yeah, so here's the amulet that brought me here, or may have brought me here. The 
sacred stone might be connected to Anubis. And now I'll just say my goodbyes to the sacred stone site. I'm really going to miss these guys. One, two, so all 12 of you guys, eh? Alright, hopefully I'll see you again soon. Wish me luck, everybody. Thanks.